Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to CELDEF's part three, our three-part webinar series, Nature's Rebellion Against the Corporate State. My name is Tish O'Dell and I'm an organizer with the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. And I will be facilitating this webinar this evening. Um, tonight, we continue with part two, a lake's voice in the rebellion. That lake just happens to be Lake Erie. And many of you are familiar with the law that Toledo residents passed in 2019, the Lake Erie Bill of Rights, and their issue, which was the severe algae blooms caused by industrial agriculture. Well, tonight we want to expand the conversation and the lens in which we view Lake Erie. She borders four states and two countries. She's under threat for many issues and many projects. And we have three presenters this evening who will address some of the many threats to both Lake Erie and the communities that depend on her. Before we get started, I just want to let you know that we are recording this webinar and that it will be available for sharing on the CELDEF YouTube channel and the CELDEF website. Also, you can type questions into the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen or into chat and Mark E. Miller will be monitoring the chat this evening. We will try to get to as many as possible before our eight o'clock end time, but we realize in this short amount of time, we won't get to all of them. But this is just meant to be a conversation starter and you can contact CELDEF at any time. And we also hope you'll continue the conversation after each of the webinars in your own communities. So let's get started with our first speaker this evening, Heather Kuhn. Heather lives in Buffalo, New York, and is currently attending the University of Buffalo School of Law. Heather has a passion for an environmental and social justice. She has worked at Neighborhood Legal Services, assisting people with public benefits issue, homeless issues requiring placement in shelters, and supplemental security income appeals. Heather has worked with other community members on multiple issues in Buffalo, ranging from labeling genetically modified food, organizing food cooperatives to incorporate local businesses and ideas, and banning hydraulic fracturing in New York. She is currently networking with people in the Western New York area to protect Lake Erie from corporations who want to install industrial wind turbines to export energy and resources from the Western New York region to downstate New York. Heather, turning it over to you. Thank you. So um, I'm going to be talking about Lake Erie and the Buffalo waterfront. And in the summer of 2020, the Erie Canal Harbor Development Corp Corporation predicted that over 1.5 million people made their way to the city's waterfront attractions, including festivals, the Sunday Farmer's Market, and public free drive-in movie nights. Food trucks, kayaks, water bikes, and stand-up paddle market and public, or I'm sorry, and paddle boats were available. <clears throat> Gallagher Beach was also open this past summer and is the first public beach in the city of Buffalo. There is also a beautiful view of the sunset. Okay. The Buffalo River. The Buffalo River win winds its way through rural areas in western New York to Lake Erie, just south of Niagara Falls. The river turns into Gazanovia Creek, then splits off and continues through smaller creeks and streams. The river was subjected to an influx of industrial waste, sewage, toxic chemicals, and other pollutants. In 1929, a biological survey concluded that the river seemed to contain no form of uh, fish life. It has been biologically dead as recently as the 1960s. In 1987, the river was listed as a Great Lakes area of concern, one of 43 toxic hotspots. Due to restor restoration projects since 2010, the work is expecting to lead to the delisting of the Buffalo River as an area of concern by 2022. Hey, Heather, I don't want to, your screen share isn't up. I don't know if you forgot to hit screen oh. share. Okay, so there's the beautiful sunset. And then there's the rivers and lakes, and that's um, 
the Niagara River right there, that's Grand Island, and this is the waterfront area. Buffalo's Outer Harbor underwent a $13.5 million environmental restoration to improve public access to the waterfront. This site has gone through a transformation, uh, said State Environmental Conservation Commissioner Pete Granis, from an environmental wasteland standing as a barrier between the Buffalo community and the Lake Erie waterfront to a spectacular green space and recreational resource. The Buffalo Outer Harbor is situated on Lake Erie, this respite features more than 200 acres of green space, including Wellness Trail, Wilkeson Point, the Lakeside uh, Bike Park, and a playground. Canal Side. <clears throat> People go there to walk, swim, run, bike, boat, picnic, play, fish, to watch the sunset. They enjoy bike trails, walking trails, and plenty of restaurants and places to go fishing and boating. Holiday festivals abound. What do Western New York residents want? Residents say they envision a world-class destination improving seasonal recreation with bike trails and boat launching. However, most people say they also want to preserve nature as much as possible. One Buffalo resident explained, I think they really need to put an emphasis on keeping it natural so people can enjoy nature, Times Beach, the water. It would be great if we could actually swim in the water. And Gallagher Beach was actually just recently uh, restored so that people can swim. Residents told News 4 that they do not want to see any sort of housing at the city's outer harbor or any new structures. Tiff Nature Preserve is home to many birds, bats, deer, and aquatic life. In May of 2017, a study published in Biological Conservation stated that their results suggest that wind energy development may pose a substantial threat to migratory bats in North America. In a study done in August of 2019 in Northern Germany, the scientists concluded that the wind turbine density was a strong predictor of collision mortality of whitetail eagles. The study highlighted that wind turbines should not be placed in core population areas of vulnerable bird species because synergies between wind turbine densities and habitat suitability may cause disproportionate increases in mortality. Tiff Nature Preserve is across the street from the Buffalo Outer Harbor. Tiff Nature Preserve is a 264-acre nature refuge dedicated to conservation and environmental education. During the 50s and 60s, Tift's land was a dump site for a city refuse. Tift began its transformation to a nature preserve in the 70s. And now it, um, it is home to many birds, bats, deer, and aquatic life, which may be jeopardized by wind turbines across the street. Unity Island sits in the Niagara River, just north of the Outer Harbor and just south of Grand Island in the Niagara River. Gravel, sand, and silt dredged from the bottom of the Buffalo River was once so toxic it had to be hauled off to somebody else's backyard. After a $75 million cleanup, sediment coming out of the river is healthy enough to be used to build a new habitat for fish, shorebirds, turtles, and other aquatic life on Buffalo's Unity Island. How will wind turbines affect the Outer Harbor and Canal Side and Unity Island? In 2008, Dr. Nina Pierpont, a physician scientist from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, gave testimony before the New York State Legislature uh, Energy Committee, stating many concerns regarding wind, wind turbines and the effects on public health. Amongst her concerns, she reported the following occurred within the introduction of wind turbines sleep problems, headaches, dizziness, unsteadiness, and nausea, exhaustion, anxiety, anger, irritability, and depression, problems with concentration and learning, and tinnitus or ringing of the ears. Who funds the Green Movement in New York? NYSERDA and its child organization, the New York 
Green Bank Award grant, uh, Green Bank awarded grant funding to the following. So um, basically here we're looking at um, Energy Renew donated 42,000 to Cuomo and then Energy was uh, rewarded with $18 million. Conifer Realty donated 45,000 and received 75,000 in taxpayer money. This, this is all grant. Brookfield Renewable donated 100,000 to Cuomo and received $360 million in grant money. And Renew Financial donated 325,000 to Cuomo and received $20 million in grant money. Next Era Energy Transmission donated 10,500 and received $1.4 billion in grants. The Green Bank uh, is using public money. And so um, according to Jessica Azule of the Executive Director of Alliance for a Green Economy, she states that low income households pay a disproportionate amount of their income to fund the Green Bank when compared to wealthy households. Dr. Bandana Shiva, a physicist uh, scientist states that billionaires do not have philanthropy because their billions are made through the violent economies of extraction and because they use their billions in philanthropy to create more markets and make more money. So uh, also according to Dr. Vandana Shiva, these were the numbers of billionaires um, that existed in these years and in 2017 were down to eight billionaires, one being number one uh, being Bill Gates. And, um, and according, uh, let's see. Oh, okay. So according to Bill Gates, if uh, he said, if we look at where we've had huge success in the past, government has been there to fund the basic research. We have to pair that with people who are willing to fund high risk breakthrough energy companies. That formula will accelerate the innovation and the risk taking. And so that concludes my portion of the presentation. And unmute. Thank you, Heather, and for giving everyone another perspective on impacts that sustainable and renewable energy production can mean for Lake Erie and the community. Um, a lot of times we only hear about the fossil fuel side of it. Um, in order for everyone um, to get a better understanding of the threats to Lake Erie and the people along her shores, we're going to move on to our next speaker. And then we'll follow with Q&A after all the speakers have had a chance to present. But please feel free to type your questions into um, chat or in the Q&A so you don't forget them. So next up, we're going to have a well-known Ohio environmental lawyer and defender of the people, Terry Lodge. Terry is a trial lawyer living in Toledo who's represented many clients in civil rights, civil liberties, and environmental cases. An advocate for the public interest in energy policy issues, he has litigated nuclear power safety and environmental issues for over 40 years. He has also represented opponents of nuclear weapons and mountaintop removal mining. More recently, he has been working with the nonprofit Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund assisting and defending communities fighting for local self-governance and rights of nature. He believes the return to democratic roots is essential to resist climate chaos and to be an equitable society. Terry? Oh, thank you very much, Tish. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to talk about two loosely related topics tonight. Uh, essentially, the radioactive threat to the uh, Great Lakes Basin, and the Lake Erie Basin in particular. Um, so I'll just jump right in. Radioactive brine is one of them. Radioactive brine is an increasing uh, uh, usage, seeing increasing usage across Ohio. Every year, uh, millions of gallons in Ohio are sprayed on everything from township roads that are unpaved and and are, are essentially dirt and gravel roads to the Ohio Turnpike, interstates, 
city streets, county highways. It is an ongoing experiment um, as to how much unnoticed radiation can be introduced into our already polluted biosphere, our living environment. How many epidemic cancers until we realize there's an epidemic? Um, brine is the highly corrosive salty liquid from either horizontal drilling, i.e. fracking, or vertical drilling for oil and gas called con conventional drilling. It's used on Ohio roads and highways, as I indicated, as a wintertime de-icer and a summertime dust suppressant. Doing really well with the slides, Marky, good. Brine is radioactive waste. Oil and gas drilling involves extraction, not just of oil, but of a veritable underground sea of radioactive water containing radium, thorium, and other naturally occurring isotopes. Sorry, one of my, uh, one of my dogs is commenting. I'm going to shut my room door. My apologies, folks. Brian is a byproduct of pumping out oil and gas. It's separated from the oil and gas. It becomes waste and is disposed of either by injection into the earth or recycled to frack, to uh, use, distribute chemicals underground to stimulate production, or it's renamed as a beneficial use and sprayed on highways where it runs off, as the uh, photo shows, into gutters and surface waters, wetlands, creeks, and rivers, and in Northern Ohio, that ultimately means into Lake Erie and the Lake Erie watershed. It took, it takes 12,000 years for radium-226, which is the major uh, radioactive component, to decay down to relatively harmless background levels. Radioactivity from radium and thorium-232 isn't a chemical that breaks down in weeks, doesn't break down under sunlight, it doesn't weather, radiation can't be filtered, out or chemically neutralized once it is in the lake it is a forever problem effectively if you consider 12,000 years to be a, 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 essentially forever and the more radioactive deicer that's used the greater the content of radioactivity in the watershed it also of course evaporates to some extent and precipitates throughout the upper midwest region the human body misinterprets radium in the bloodstream to be calcium or potassium, and so it's distributed into the bones and bone marrow, where the alpha radiation emanating from radium bombards surrounding cells. It ultimately causes sarcomas, bone cancers, and cancers of other internal organs. Annually, the Ohio Department of Transportation spreads hundreds of thousands up to a million gallons or more of radioactive deicer. In 2018 to 2019, the city of Toledo spread almost 5,000 gallons in about half of the winter season. The state law allows 3,000 gallons to be sprayed per 12-foot wide lane mile of highway. 60 miles of a two-lane highway, in other words, would be 360,000 gallons of radioactive brine. Think about that in connection with the turnpike. There's no limit on how often radioactive waste can be applied. A leading brine brand, and I think that is uh, about uh, slide number four or five, Marky. Going. Aqua Salina is a leading brand, the leading brand. It is tested it by the Ohio Department of Natural Resources to spike as high as 500 times the allowable levels for radiation in drinking water and averages about 300 times the allowable levels for radiation in drinking water. I realize we're comparing something that is sprayed on the road to something that we drink, but uh, in, in the end, we are drawing many, many utilities, certainly the Toledo Water Division draws the regional water supply from Lake Erie. So that's sort of the, the whole watershed problem. This is a major, major and unseen problem politically in the Ohio General Assembly. There are attempts to legitimate the use of brine as a commodity with minimal testing, minimal tracking, minimal certification. It is in widespread use across the state, as I indicated, uh, within the city of Toledo. 
uh, in, in Lucas County, and of course across the turnpike and the interstate. The other problem I want to talk about is nuclear power. There are 30 operating nuclear reactors on 11 sites in the Great Lakes Basin. I'm going to talk a lot about Davis Bessey, which is near Port Clinton. The three major reactor accidents in the history of nuclear power that are of note to people include Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima. They were all major disasters. Chernobyl and Fukushima are ongoing industrial disasters. They're still unfolding today. Chernobyl was in 1986, but uh, is uh, undergoing attempts to recontain the radiation that has been leaking from its dis disastrously poor since that time. Fukushima uh, was a combined accident that caused the meltdown of three reactors, probably four reactors, in uh, 2011 and is still ongoing today. The nuclear cores of all those reactors are in various stages of collapse and decay, are extremely radioactive, and constantly have to have water, seawater basically, is being circulated through them 24 hours a day. Uh, it becomes very radioactive, and the Japanese government very controversially is allowing it to be dumped into the Pacific Ocean. It is believed and estimated by many field biologists that most or all of the fish in the Pacific Basin contain Fukushima radiation, and it is only going to increase. Davis Bessey, Ohio's own, has seen many sobering near misses, and that's the problem with nuclear energy. It's licensed to emit a little bit of radiation, and that certainly happens at every operating reactor. But the real fear is the sudden accidental side of things. Davis Bessey is a clone of Three Mile Island that, uh, of course, ex experienced an almost total core meltdown in 1979. People don't remember that in 1977, during startup operations, Davis Bessey nearly went out of control. It was only operating at about 9% of power and a bright young reactor operator figured out what was happening and shut down the plant before it started cascading beyond control. A, an NRC inspector at the plant at that time realized what was happening, put together the fact that there were seven other clone reactors of Davis Bessey, sister reactors if you want to call them that, and tried to notify his superiors within the NRC of the danger and also tried to notify the builder, Babcock Wilcox, and for his trouble, he was, of course, demoted, uh, shipped to a different regional office, and uh, Three Mile Island happened in March of 1979. In 1985, at Davis Bessey, a series of operator misreads sent the reactor into an unstable state. It was shut down in a breathtaking uh, chase that is a, it's a, remarkable engineering report to read where technicians raced into the reactor with bolt cutters and had to cut through chains that had been installed to keep people from opening the cooling water, high pressure cooling water valves to let the, the core be flooded. In 1998, a tornado, the largest direct hit by a tornado on a nuclear power plant anywhere happened at Davis Bessey, cut off the connection to the electrical grid the reactor was shut down safely, but the backup generators, which are locomotive-sized, uh, faltered, and uh, one of them nearly overheated and went completely out of service 24 hours after the accident. It was 41 hours until the grid was reconnected, so there was a stable source of electricity to keep systems functioning at Davis Bessey. In 2003, there was an infamous uh, near disaster, a very near disaster, the hole in the head, seven inch thick steel lid of the reactor had been eroded by the constant drip of acidic water. And um, it was about the size of a loaf of bread, but with very jagged edges. And there was an in, a liner, three sixteenths inch steel liner inside the lid that was bulging against the jagged cracks the utility, which was a 
First Energy resisted NRC requests to shut it down and inspect the reactor head. Finally, when the NRC prevailed months after their original request, it was discovered that Davis Vesey was literally days away from a massive rupture of superheated water and steam into the building and a probable core meltdown. Since 2011, we have known of increasing and spreading micro cracks and visible cracks in the 30 inch thick rebar enforced shield building, the cylindrical building that contains the reactor at Davis Vesey. It is cracking, there are chunks of concrete falling out of the building. It is, it has been estimated by some engineers that there could be large chunks of concrete that would ultimately work their way loose. This is of course due to the infiltration of uh, water over the decades since the shield building was built in the early 70s. Uh, so the problem is, is that some engineers have predicted that there is some possibility that large chunks of concrete could fall from the interior side of the shield building walls down onto the reactor, which could be, of course, catastrophic. So you have Lake Erie and much of the Great Lakes Basin. It's animals, plants, and people are harmed or threatened with these great dangers, while the invisible hand of the marketplace threatens suddenly or slowly to spread cancer, threatens permanent destruction. People and resources are only as protected as much as political economy allows. Nature doesn't have recognized rights. Since the 70s, I've opposed nuclear power in state and federal agencies, but we have difficulty even attaining standing for people to participate in this sort of litigation. The uh, NRC has, Nuclear Regulatory Commission has close to impossible requirements for the public to participate. They are burdened with the expense and problem of moving forward in litigation. And for more than a decade, I've worked to resist oil and gas fracking and have learned how difficult it is to move about and use the legal system to protect resources like lakes, like water bodies. Uh, the lake is a living entity. If it fails, we fail. As Tish said, Lake Erie borders four states and two countries. We have an obligation and responsibility to our families and communities now, as well as that posterity thing. We can't continue down this path. We can start with individual local laws and communities where people understand that change needs to happen. Eventually, if enough of them understand, it can provide the spark to push the rights of nature into a lot greater prominence. Lake Erie is not just property be, to be used and exploited for corporate profit. <clears throat> when we talk about the right of Lake Erie to exist, we're asserting our own right to survive and flourish. That has to come to a time when it outweighs the right to pollute, destroy, abuse the watershed. One of the geniuses of the Lake Erie Bill of Rights was that citizens would be given a right to sue to protect that small part of Lake Erie, a few square miles, located within the boundaries of Toledo. We took a lot of criticism. People were complaining about how can you purport to protect, you know, thousands of square miles of Lake Erie. And my response and that of a lot of people was, we're just trying to protect that part that runs through Toledo. By doing that, if it happens to benefit the whole basin, that's just great. And that is where it has to start. You, you must learn. We must take a stand where we are with our local law, with our local ability, our local self-empowerment to stop what's going on and so it can grow. Thanks. Terry, thank you so much for showing everyone, I mean, that Lake Erie is crying out for so many reasons. Um, we're gonna move on to our last um, speaker right now. And last but not least, we have Taru Taylor with us. Taru graduated from Case Western Reserve Law School 
in 2018. In his words, he went to law school to learn all about how we the people are the first branch of government that as jurors and electors, we check and balance the other three branches of government. He is also the president and co-founder of Black Belt Chess Academy, a nonprofit corporation devoted to teaching and coaching chess to inner city kids of Cleveland and East Cleveland. Welcome to Rue. Thanks for the introduction. <clears throat> and um, actually, uh, my presentation will address Terry's point about standing. Um, so in the conclusion, I'll, I'll bring up uh, former Associate Justice William Douglas had some ideas about the problem of standing. But overall, I'd like to uh, present a more, um, I, uh, a presentation just kind of lo looking at the larger questions and framing the issues of environmentalism um, that it seems to me that really the issue comes down to, are we dealing with, so uh, if you include Washington, D.C., are we dealing with 51 republics as guaranteed to us by the Article 4 guarantee of a republican form of government, or are we dealing with 51 police states under the hegemony of 1% dominion? That seems to me the, the fundamental question um, as to home rule and um, uh, democracy as opposed to corporate dominion. And so I'd like to, um, so uh, if you could, Tish, can you put up the uh, diagram? And so I think this, this diagram, I learned about this, uh, from uh, Leslie Hofeld. Leslie Hofeld uh, was a legal scholar at the turn of the century. And he came up with this framework for understanding issues of rights and um, how people interact as far as that goes. Now, the, um, all right, one second. So basically, um, anytime, so on the left, uh, the, you have the right duty relation. And so whenever two people or two parties interact, one party has um, the right to do something and then the other party is duty bound to respect the party's rights. Um, so either you have that relation or you have one of privilege and no right. Uh, and in this situation, the um, one party do really doesn't have to answer, can do whatever they want, and the, there's no recourse in terms of uh, courts of law. And so when we're uh, talking about democracy and the Republican form of government, basically, the left side of this diagram, that would, on the top, rights, that would refer to our Ninth Amendment, uh, unenumerated rights that are retained by the people, and the Tenth Amendment, um, power to the people, like those are the two amendments that really speak to popular sovereignty and the natural rights of we the people. And also uh, keeping in mind that the preamble to the Constitution, that it speaks in terms of the present tense. Even though the Constitution was ratified by the generation of 1787, nevertheless, it speaks in the present tense that we the people do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Note, it's not past tense. So present problems, and whatever situations befall us in the present moment, it's our responsibility as the people, as the first branch of government to deal with these problems. And so <clears throat> I like to just, uh, I, because I, I do think it's really important that we the people have the proper mind frame as far as dealing with these issues of uh, not only environmentalism, 
sexism, racism, all manner of problems that come out of really what, um, so the divine right of kings was, ostens was ostensibly what the American Revolution um, went against. And so establishing the rule of law, John Adams defined that as government of laws, not of men. And so that as opposed to the, the divine right of kings. But unfortunately, what has replaced the divine right of kings, uh, especially in light of what Occupy Wall Street framed as the 1%, what we have are the dominion of the divine right of wealthy white men. That is really, and especially wealthy white men who are in command of um, the uh, big business and the commanding corporations. But anyway, I just wanted to kind of read uh, just a few um, quotes from the Federalist Papers that speak to the uh, popular sovereignty and at least kind of give us some talking points from a constitutional standpoint. So, um, so in Federalist number 10, that's the that's where that's one of the more famous Federalist Papers where Madison uh, talks about the problem of factionalism, and uh, one of the quotes from there is, and he talks about the public good. Now, looking again at the Hofeld diagram, the point here is that public officials, what defines their duty to the citizenry, is the public good. All of their actions should be with reference to the public good. And so on this point, Madison says, quote, to secure the public good and private rights against the danger of faction and to preserve the spirit and form of popular government is then the great object to which our inquiries are directed. So again, th there really was a conception of the public good um, at, in that generation. And so when we're talking about like Erie and other problems uh, the, with the environment, that's we should be thinking within that framework. Now, as to Republic, in Federalist number 49, Madison defines a Republic as, quote, government which derives all of its powers directly or indirectly from the great body of the people and is administered by persons holding their offices during pleasure for a limited period or during good behavior. So, um, so we the people, right? We delegate powers to governments and public officials. And so that speaks to that point. Now in, um, in Federalist number 45, Madison defines the public good as the real welfare of the great body of the people. And he says, no form of government whatever has any other value than as it may be fitted for the attainment of this object. So there again, uh, government, the purpose of government is to bring about the public good. Um, <clears throat> And moreover, in Federalist number 46, Madison says that the, um, he defines the federal and state governments as, quote, agents and trustees of the people. So they are our agents. They are entrusted with the public good. And moreover, he says, quote, the ultimate authority resides in the people alone. So we are the authority. Um, the we the people, the citizens. The citizen is sovereign. And in um let's see, in Federalist number 78, Hamilton talks about sovereignty. That's one of the themes of that particular essay. And he says the intention of the people is more important than the intention of their agents, which is to say public officials, that the power of the people is more important or supersedes legislative and judicial power. And that the will of the people is declared in the constitution, not the, and the will of the legislature is declared in various statutes and such. And finally, 
he says that a fundamental principle of government, Republican government, is that it admits the right of the people to alter or abolish the established constitution whenever they find it inconsistent with that with their happiness. So these are um, basic points, again, speaking to the left side of the Hofeld diagram, whereby we the people have natural rights, we have popular sovereignty, and public officials are supposed to do their duty to bring about the public good as we understand it. Now, the, the um, opposite of that is the uh, police state that I mentioned earlier. And this is, this is one where uh, we under, if we under, understand the police power, really the police power um, speaks to the dominion, as I mentioned before, of the 1%, and the understanding of the state as kind of an extended household, keeping in mind that economics originally just meant household management. And so the, the view of society as a whole as the kind of greater household, that's how like the king's peace was defined in terms of the king as the head patriarch. Keeping in mind that the familia, uh, which is the, where our concept of family comes from, that, that's the uh, household of servants. The, and the wife was the head domestic servant and the patriarch had power of life and death over all of them. And the police power more broadly is this sense of management of the household from this, um, from this perspective. Let's see, I'm kind of running low on time, but um, that's, and so that, that's really what we're, so, and, and that's more on the right side where the privilege of the 1% and the and the police officers and judges and such that their um, understanding of things kind of supersedes the people. Now, um, <clears throat> sir, I want to bring up. Uh, Terry mentioned the problem of standing, and interestingly, uh, there is a case, and I'm sure I know Terry knows all about this case. Sierra Club versus Morton from 1972. And this is a case where the Supreme Court rejected the Sierra, the Sierra Club. They, um, they put forth a lawsuit again, uh, for the Mineral King. And there was some ski resort that was trying to uh, basically uh, bringing about environmental problems. And they rejected the lawsuit, but Douglas dissented. And so, and I'll just, uh, so Douglas said the critical question of standing would be simplified and also put neatly in focus if we fashioned a federal rule that allowed environmental issues to be litigated before federal agencies or federal courts in the name of the inanimate object about to be despoiled, defaced, or invaded by roads and bulldozers, and where injury is the subject of public outrage. Uh, contemporary public concern for protecting nature's ecological equilibrium should lead to the conferral of standing upon environmental objects to sue for their own preservation. And then he says, this suit would therefore be more properly labeled as Mineral King versus Morton. Now, uh, Douglas goes on to talk about how corporations are able to sue through this fiction of personhood. And that's a way in which, again, going back to the right side of the diagram, privilege, how the one percent have dominated uh, we the people, and so here Douglas is is suggesting that uh, for the ninety nine percent we should employ uh, personhood as a fiction, so that um, for example Lake Erie uh, should be able to have standing. And I, I'll I'll close with a quote from um, William Douglas in his book Points of Rebellion, speaking on these issues. He says. Quote, everyone knows, including the youthful dissenters, that Lake Erie is now only a tub filled with stinking sewage and wastes. Many of our rivers are open sewers, end quote. And this book, uh, Points of Rebellion, was written, uh, published in 1970. And so that's, um, so yeah, I think I'm basically out of time here, but uh, I just wanted to kind of sort of look at the, 
that we as we the people have to start framing these issues from the standpoint of sovereignty. And uh, it's just really important that we have that mindset. So I just wanted to kind of and suggest that the whole field diagram is a useful tool or frame of analysis. Thank you. Thanks, Taru. That, that, yeah, it's an interesting take because that's a struggle that we all, you know, have, right? How do we protect the lake when it sustains all of our lives? So um, I want to thank all three of you for helping us to see that, you know, both Lake Erie and the people in the communities that depend on her for life are indeed connected. And I think a lot of what you mentioned, Taru, is a lot of what we are trying to accomplish with rights of nature. Um, it, it, when you were talking, it made against lethal poisons distributed either by private individuals or by public officials, it is surely only because our forefathers, despite their considerable wisdom and foresight, could conceive of no such problem. So, you know, like that they never even thought we would even do this, you know, pollute the water that sustains our lives. Um, I think we're going to, I'm going to turn it over right now. We're going to go to the Q&A portion. And Marky, you have been monitoring chat. So do you want to um, ask the first question from chat? Sure. Yeah, I can get us started. Um, I've been trying to keep track of them and I'll distribute to each presenter, but feel free, anyone can, can chime in and help to answer some of these questions for sure. So, um, the first question is from Valerie for Terry. Uh, it says, I would like to know where it would be a good, even if partial list of fracking liquid or what they're calling in New Mexico produced water components. We're having a hard time showing the radioactive components. Um. There are a number of studies by Professor Vinash, is it, from uh, North Carolina of the contents of fracking liquid produced water um, that I believe do go into extensive detail. Also, um, if you simply want a kind of a composite picture of the uh, chemistry and radiation um, the uh, studies that the, the test results that were generated by the Ohio Department of Natural Resources in, I believe, 2017, that became very controversial about the Aqua Salina um, de-icer are available at various places online. If you want to uh, give us an email address contact, which probably we have, um, I will see what I can dig up and provide you. Uh, it, it's interesting that in 2017, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources bought some of the jugs of uh, Aqua Salina off the shelf at a Lowe's and at a hardware store somewhere in Northeastern Ohio and just tested, found out that um, one of the, uh, one of the jugs was 500 times background or allowable radiation um, I, I mean, it's just phenomenal that this is available retail. You can put it on your driveway. You can uh, poison your children. Amazing. Kill your pets. It's great. Um, Heather, I have a question for you on um, if you could speak to how your local community in Buffalo has responded to the wind turbine project. Well, right now, um, we're just finding out that um, that Cuomo looks like he is going through um, with the wind turbine issue. Um, we don't really know exactly how we're going to respond at this point. Um, one of the things that I, I wanted to point out, though, is when these corporations receive basically public money, they're setting aside a portion of that money to use against us 
for their legal defense. So one of the terms that I heard in um, my ethics course was the cost of doing business. So, you know, one thing that we need to think about when we're preparing is, you know, that they already have a portion of money set aside for legal costs. So. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is kind of addressed to both Taru and Terry. If you could talk more about, about the idea of challenge of the legal system with regard to rights of nature and other rights-based fights, as well as the idea that our rights are natural. One of you volunteer to start and then the other one can pick up. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that, that's, uh, that's not a hugely complicated question, Gwen. Um, <laughs> thanks. Um, the, the challenge of the legal system is that it is oriented toward the protection of property and that rights of nature are very incidental um, and, and at times a profitable sort of uh, corner. Uh, I'm, as I'm looking down through the questions, I'm seeing uh, whether there have been rights of nature suits fighting for the standing of forests. And yes, CELDEF has been involved in a number of uh, things related to um, trying to protect natural features besides Lake Erie. Um, the, the challenge is that the system of legal protections for the natural resources is very weak. It is humanity oriented, anthropomorphic, I guess. I don't know what you, that's the right term. But that essentially, um, there are, for instance, the Clean Water Act, there's, there's a way of launching a lawsuit, but you have to give a 60 day notice to the polluter and to the regulatory agency to clean up their act. And uh, there's all, all kinds of means of delay. So it's not, really a very clear opportunity to, to assert the interests of, for instance, the polluted river or the polluted Lake Erie. Um, so what we're talking about is trying to establish some sort of beachhead that actually stems from, as Teru was outlining, local control, the power of people to assert that there is a different legal value present here that it's more than contracts, it's more than property, it's more than protecting means of exploiting natural resources. I could go real deep into, you know, the sort of Judeo-Christian stewardship model, which seems to govern and dictate how we exploit natural resources. Um, the, the problem is, is that property rights are, are very, very supreme in our culture, in our society, in our economy, and in our legal economy. And so carving out or establishing the, the, the very earliest beachhead is, is what we're about doing. You, Taru. Um, yeah, I would just add to that, as far as natural law and natural rights, that really, uh, and this one expression of this comes out of the Declaration of Independence, where they said that um, legitimacy of government is based on the consent of the governed. And so this idea that, so that speaks to the social contract and that, we've, that we really, uh, common sense, and in fact, there is, uh, there is, in Federalist number 83, Hamilton, Talking about the rules of legal interpretation, Hamilton says that the rules of common sense, um, really, that the true test of legal interpretation is their conformity with the rules of common sense. And really, common sense, this, the, the rule of law is based on the popular idea of what that means. Even um, judicial review is a usurpation of uh, that the Constitution 
fundamentally is based on the voting power of the people that we, the voting power of the people is what determines constitutional meaning. But in 1803, uh, Madison usurped that role and, and basically brought about this judicial despotism of these judges, five, basically a five person majority determining constitutional meaning. When really the constitution is written in for the public, for the, for the populace, for we the people ordain and establish it. So judges and legislators and executives, they're agents of us, like we delegate them power. And so we've allowed them to um, dominate us. And just one other, like we, natural rights. I mean, natural rights are enshrined in the constitution through the ninth amendment. But uh, we, we allow these judges to just get away with dismissing natural rights and just defining everything in terms of their ideas of positive rights and what they want to arbitrarily determine as constitutional. So are you kind of like, kind of like in the rebellions that we saw prior to the revolution where they actually went in and you know took the judges out i mean obviously they were judges appointed by the king at the time and so they took them out of the courthouses and locked the courthouse doors so i'm like kind of laughing i'm wondering is that kind of what we're suggesting here hmm. no comment <laughs> Um, Taru, I think you tried to make a comment, but you were muted. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I was just, just to kind of, uh, I mean, we take judicial review for, for granted, but again, that's judge made. That's not inherently constitutional. Right. Yet in some of the cases in Ohio that we've brought with some of our um, citizen initiatives, the judges have even, then at some point when they don't want to, they go, well, it's not our role to make law, you know, we're not here for that. But then when they want to change the law in other certain interests, then all of a sudden they make it. So they're not consistent with that. Um, next question is for Terry. Can municipalities and townships ban fracking brine spread on state routes passing through their jurisdiction? Am I unmuted? Okay, good. Um, yes, I think the challenge needs to be brought. It's not clear. There was some tinkering with the Ohio statute recently. Basically, uh, um, it appears that the state, the Department of Transportation, so long as it has an understanding or written agreement with the local municipality to do the maintenance and the snow removal on state routes falling within Toledo, for instance, um, it may be that the state will claim that it has preemption, it has a superior right to do whatever it deems necessary to maintain the highways. But uh, I think that it raises an interesting question because the same law also allows municipalities to basically vote do not use or, or receive citizen petitions and take them seriously to not use brine on other city streets and thoroughfares. So I think that there's there's an issue there, and frankly, I think it, it's a point that needs pushing because it would be have some symbolic as well as legal value. Symbolic in terms of protecting home turf. Uh, uh, having decisions, local decisions made by people about conditions directly affecting them and uh, about the, uh, the whole power of the sovereign to uh, impose a rather mindless policy on local governments and local people. Okay, thank you. Um, and this is for anyone who would like to answer. Could the First Amendment play a role in challenging the language which prevents a person from speaking on behalf of nature and ecosystems in a 
Common Pleas Court in Ohio. Yep. Yes, it could. I mean, that's a straight answer. Yes, as as uh, you know, the state legislature in a buried in a budget bill um, tried to make it unlawful to raise and assert the rights of nature in a court. I think that that raises an inherent problem that the the courts are an exclusive and different branch of government from the legislature and the courts themselves are able to decide what is a proper legal type of claim that can be advanced. There is a lot of controversy over whether the General Assembly gets to dictate what is permissible to sue over. And I think that that's a particularly weak, shabby law that was uh, ramrodded through by some special interests, as Tish indicated, uh, uh, who actually were acting beyond the time to add things to the budget bill. Another sneaky, non-public act of legislating that is frequently uh, accomplished by the Ohio General Assembly. Thank you, Terry. Um, there was just a comment from uh, Ray that said, I wonder if solar panels could be put in place of the nuclear electric generator property. Or I'm sorry, in place on the electric generator property. Yes. Um, what the utilities attempt to do, understand that most nuclear power plants are located in usually in very beautiful places. They're often by bodies of water. Uh, Davis Bessie was actually built upon what was formerly a federal uh, nature preserve. And they, they bought nearby land and swapped it. It became the Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge. But nuclear power reactors are built in, in lovely locations. And so what the utilities try to do, they actually create a polluted, contaminated, radioactive brownfield. And what they are attempting to do is, as reactors are going, uh, are, are being shut down and dismantled, is they try to, they do a, a minimal amount of remediation and try to, uh, in, in northern Michigan, Big Rock Point up near Traverse City, uh, is now a site of condo developments. So, I mean, the thing is, is that, uh, sure, solar collectors you know, photovoltaic arrays, things like that should be erected on brown fields near the power, near the, the end usage point. Um, it's how much money the utilities are going to try to squeeze out of their land. Um, someone put in a question, Valerie. Um, how about using our federal lands as a beachhead and cost to them and thus the taxpayers? If we can show that it costs us all, all of us, the taxpayers, et cetera, massive money as a consequence of these corporate actions, can we not sue on that basis? Beachheads could be economic impact, health impact, quality of life impact, mental health impacts, which can now be shown enough which can now be shown enough to judge in a court of law. Someone want to take that? I don't want to monopolize the whole conversation. I think we have a couple of bright young lawyers here and I want to hear from them. Yeah. Well, um, I suppose one way of kind of thinking about that uh, I'm not sure if this is what the what Valerie is getting at, but the idea, the Article Six, the idea that the rule of law, um, that uh, as far as federal lands, um, hmm. sorry, <laughs> never mind. Well, one thing I want, I mean, I want to just add looking at it, I'm thinking, you know, that's part of our problem with our system currently, right? We have to wait 
for the harm to occur and then try to go into court and show that this harm has been done and it, that it's cost us money either to fix us or that we've got, you know, polluted water or that we've, you know, got high can or a cancer cluster or whatever. And so I think that whole way of thinking has to change and our, our you know, legal system has to change. That, and that's what rights of nature part of that is about. It's about having the standing to get into court to prevent the harm before it occurs. Right. Um, and maybe, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No. Go oh, ahead. just, well, just maybe one way of kind of thinking of it is too, is that ultimately the fundamental unit is the individual citizen. And, uh, or like that our, American citizenship supersedes whatever state citizenship we may have. And so, I mean, kind of reading between the lines of this question, um, the sort of looking at that we, all of us as citizens should have standing as far as um, the federal, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> I mean, should. I mean, a lot of this, yeah. I mean, a lot of this is, uh, but I mean, we need critical masses of us understanding yes, uh, yes. our popular sovereignty and understanding we the people. I mean, once we have critical masses, then we can uh, bring about these Tenth Amendment power to the people type. Uh, but just too many of us get railroaded because for the most part, we, we don't understand how much power we do have or constitutional rights that we do have. And, but and, I, this doesn't deal with this question, really. Also, I'd just like to chime in that it is very, very problematic. Everything that Valerie is asking about is legal. When you especially look at, at federal uh, Department of Agriculture managed lands, federal forests, the approach is multi what it's called multiple use, where you develop recreation, some, sometimes commercial, you develop uh, 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 roadways into the forests and, and start carving up forests and, and of course cutting down trees and clear cutting and all that. There's federal rangelands that are leased for pennies on the acre to subsidize big beef. What, what is actually going on is the federal lands are nominally owned by the public, but they are exploited to the max for fracking, for other kinds of mineral extraction, for all kinds of stuff. And, uh, and we're basically getting screwed as taxpayers because it's not bringing in very much money. And then you look at things like the offshore continental shelf where oil drilling takes place and the, the federal uh, the imposition of federal fees and charges for that goes for the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which is a nice, wonderful, multi-million dollar federal program for the improvement of parks. So, and I just heard last week, the state of Michigan is, is going to start allowing fracking on public forested, state forested lands in Northern Michigan, and that the money will go for parks. You know, nice, wholesome, uh, cause and effect, and you know, so you, you diminish and blunt a lot of potential political opposition by, you know, generating income without raising taxes, which is of course a, a very tried and true right-wing method of governance. So, and then I'd just like to throw in one other thing, Taxpayer lawsuits are a very fragile and rare type of thing. Taxpayer standing is usually considered by the courts not to be enough of a, just because you and I are taxpayers, uh, doesn't mean that we have an unusual interest in protecting a national forest or a game, uh, a, a wildlife refuge or something like that. Um, and so again, it comes back through to that, that damn standing situation where ironically, just because you help underwrite, just because we help pay the bills, just because we're Americans and, and these are lands that supposedly are owned in common, it doesn't seem to necessarily give us any room to complain, any way of participating other than through Congress and 
Or is that a yes? Well, one one angle too is uh, uh, like Douglas in the descent that I mentioned, the Sierra Club um, versus Morton descent. He talks about the problem of conflict of interest. Right. And he at one point he says, "quote The Forest Service, one of the federal agencies behind the scheme to despoil Mineral King." has been notorious in its alignment with lumber companies, Amen. although its mandate from Congress directs it to consider the various aspects of multiple use in its supervision of the national forests. And I mean, he basically, he just talks about how a lot of these federal agencies are um, oriented towards the interests of the industry that is supposed to regulate <laughs> rather than the public interest. And so that could be one angle of approach, sort of pointing out the conflict of interest. Um, and I know that in some of my conversations with uh, Tish, we, we've talked about how uh, a lot of judges have conflicts of interest where they are caught up with these corporations. A lot of them are former corporate attorneys, sometimes representing the very firms that they're deciding on in these cases. Uh, so that's a huge problem, uh, just the rampant problem of conflict of interest. Yes. So as a law student, I feel like I can't really address this, but I have a question around it um, in terms of, it seems to me like in the history of, of law, where um, citizens were trying to file a lawsuit, like against, say, the state, um, it it always defers to the state, to the representatives, because we voted them in. But if we have, like, a, I, I'm just wondering if it would work if we could file a lawsuit to say, well, no matter which person we vote for, they are beholden to the corporations. So it's essentially, you know, a bunch of corporations running for office. And so we no longer have the ability to vote for somebody who is going to represent our own interests. Yeah. Correct. I think Ralph Nader called George W. Bush a corporation masking as a human being. Yes, very much so. And and I've seen there's a, there have been some funny but very painful um, Photoshop pictures of, for instance, the Supreme Court or of other federal or other governmental officials in car racing jackets with, with corporate logo labels on them. <laughs> yes, indeed. We had, that, we had that circumstance, I think it was in Grant Township where the judge, it was Judge Baxter and she actually had investments, I think, in PGE, which is the company that is trying to put the injection well in Grant Township, and she's the judge on the case. But then she, I think when it was found out, she, you know, sold the stock or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How convenient. Um, we have a question here. Why don't corporations have to prove something is safe before it is imposed on the people? <laughs> That's the question of the ages, um, because it's the law. Real simple. They're, the standards are so weak, the regulatory model is so compromised and failed that you just it isn't uh, seen as a problem. I have often, for decades, called nuclear power an evolving experiment because that's exactly what it is. Most circumstances and situations are new and novel and the industry simply maintains again and again that they will fashion some sort of ad hoc scientific or engineering solution. So yeah, we're, we are, we're guinea pigs in the fracking mess. We are guinea pigs in brine spreading. We're guinea pigs in, in, in the commercialization of big win, which is the, the thing that I've, I've followed with fracking in the last decade is that, you know, the science takes some years to catch up, but it's, it's coming 
and it's it, it, very indicting. And the same sort of thing is happening now with Big Win, where where the psychological problems are are connected to the to the low hum, the the vibrations that are not audible, to uh, uh, the uh, the flickering effect of the circulation of the blades, that kind of stuff. You know, the problem is is that we launch into this stuff, we don't use or apply the precautionary principle where where the corporation has to prove ahead of time that they aren't going to poison, despoil, and ruin us. But that's the nature of American capitalism, folks. And one of the turning points too, uh, I remember reading about and uh, the the uh, Dartmouth College case, Dartmouth College versus Woodward, 1819, 18, and that's 18, where, 19, yeah. yeah, I think the trustees uh, or the state wanted to kind of take control of the college, but then the mm -hmm. trustees made sure that the contract was a private right. contract. And so from that point on, as I understand, like that was a big turning point where corporations are seen as these private contracts as opposed to earlier, I think I quoted from the Federalist Papers where, you know, uh, agents and trustees and officials are supposed to act with reference to the people, to the republic. And contracts and corporations originally were framed with regard to the state and with regard to operating within those confines. But uh, Dartmouth, and then there have been a lot of other cases since, where the corporations are just these entities with, I mean, sovereign power basically, with very little check and balance from us, the people. Uh, so that's a huge problem. I mean, it seems like a lot of, we should be trying to overturn some of these landmark cases. Yeah, uh, kind of like how, I mean, yeah, anyway, we, we, should, we should be trying to overturn these cases that have given uh, the 1% this like dominance and 1% right. dominion basically. Yes, this is the Southern Pacific Railroad decision. The, mm -hmm. the fact that immediately after the Civil War when the Civil Rights Acts were passed to protect freed slaves in the South and provide them with access to the courts and with actual bona fide legal claims that being violations of the constitutional rights, corporations inserted their personhood into the mix. And in the in the first couple of uh, decades after the civil after 1871, actually, when the laws were passed, um, there were hundreds more corporate plaintiffs demanding their civil rights be respected than human ones, um, and thus it was. Uh, I guess deemed pretty easy for the U.S. Supreme Court under one of Toledo's favorite sons, Chief Justice Waite, to basically declare, who was a railroad lawyer, to basically find and declare that, sure, it, uh, it's an accept, it's beyond argument that corporations are people too. So yes, you're very, very, very correct. We have to understand and I and I, and it's very difficult to to get back to that whole uh, redefinition of the limits between human personhood and corporate you know whatever they call it corporate personhood I find it to be kind of a disgusting concept economic unit hood um, David wrote in, he said, um, we are guinea pigs because we don't have subsidiary mechanism, authority, knowledge, access to allow us to stop the damaging effects of others' actions. Um, I guess we'll have to found some subsidiaries, eh? <laughs> then some Valerie writes, sounds like we need to assert the rights of human personhood again to at least declare they are yes. equal. Certainly. Certainly. If you look at the Hobby Lobby decision and the, the fact that corporations have religious beliefs, please. <laughs> that they get to dictate 
what to offer in employee insurance packages because of their religious beliefs? Oh my God. So question here, it's an anonymous. It says, are concepts of popular sovereignty and citizen power sufficiently deep enough to get us out of the dominator dominated mindset that got us into this mess? For example, early in the French Revolution, the liberal revolutionaries tried to create two categories of citizens, active citizens who actually had political rights and passive citizens who didn't. Today, claiming rights for citizens disenfranchises many people, children, and many immigrants, for example. Everyone should have the political power to protect their home. Can we value future generations and the ecological sustainability of the planet when we still claim sovereignty over them? Well, um, I mean, first of all, every, every person born on U.S. soil is a citizen as far as the United States goes. So children, I mean, they haven't reached the age of majority yet as far as being able to vote and serve on a jury from 18, but at, upon birth, they're citizens. Uh, and... Uh, <clears throat> I think they're, he's talking more about valuing future generations. So they aren't. Yeah, well, um, I, I mean, this speaks to some of, uh, like, looking through the Federalist Papers and Declaration of Independence and these ideas of uh, the public good, the natural rights, natural law. If, I mean, if we thought more in those terms, then we, we could more effectively at least make arguments or more effective arguments uh, against the 1%. I mean, I, I'm not sure if that's really getting at. Well, maybe one, one um, powerful institution that has been watered down is the jury. The, uh, the institution of the, the jury, trial by jury, trial by jury of one's peers, that has been eviscerated and watered down when really, that, arguably, that's supposed to be our most powerful tool. Yes. But the courts, you know, I mentioned judicial review, but the, the judges have usurped all kinds of powers from we the people in terms of the, the jury and jury trial. Um, so that's that's a huge issue. The, the widespread use of regulatory agencies has also contributed to that evisceration because it removes issues, it assigns issues to a panel or one administrative judge mm -hmm. um, and no longer uh, requires or allows the intervention of the fact-finding capability of a jury. Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. There are some heavy thinkers in this, reading these chat questions. My people, great. Yeah. Well, I was going to say one of the things that we, you know, this is broader, is that, you know, this is all about power shifts. I mean, it's about shifting power away from, yes. you know, one entity, which is the corporations and the one percent and trying to shift power which is that's a difficult thing to do i mean that's what a movement does and it's like you're trying to you know change this whole direction of this huge like ocean liner or something you know and trying to get it to change course and but you know that is what we need to do and we need to bring it back to like what Taru's talking about and all of you, you know, back to us and we the people, that it's us. Who gets to make these decisions? That's what we're always talking about. I mean, the laws, who makes the laws? And right now it's corporations that are making the laws and we're just following them, but they're making laws to their benefit, not to ours or and, Lake Erie's or nature's. And, and how about the fact that, I mean, to me, one of the most crazy facts is that Every single Supreme Court justice, all nine of them, 
went to either Harvard or Yale Law School. Every single one. Our last two Republican presidents went to the University of Pennsylvania, School, Wharton School of Business and the Harvard School of Business. Our last two Democratic presidents went to Yale Law School and Harvard Law School. Are these schools that much better than the rest? I mean, these are titles of nobility. Like the constitution is supposed to not, like we're not supposed to have titles of nobility, but clearly these Ivy League schools are de facto titles of nobility. Why do we the people believe in this prestige and magic? Like these are some kind of, like just because you went to, like, is, like do Bush and Trump really represent the best and the brightest of the MBAs of their generation, really? just because they went to Ivy League schools. But, but this is when I'm, I mean, like, this is why I spend so much time talking about, um, the, the, you know, this popular sovereignty and getting our mind right, because we the people, we buy into the hype. I mean, it's, it's ludicrous. There are 200 something law schools in this country. And two of them, really, only two of them are worthy of Supreme Court justices, really? It's crazy that we allow this. And then if you look at if you look at the Congress, Congress people and the senators, huge percentages of them went to either Harvard, Yale, or Stanford. I think like huge percentages. Like what is that? I mean, are they really representing us, the people? But it's again our mindset. We believe in that hype. We believe in these titles of nobility. So it's a lot of it is on us. Robert Robin just wrote in. Whoops, Robin just wrote into chat and said, Harvard and Yale are part of the global government. They are part of the cult. That is their spell they have cast on us, their web of fear to get us to obey. So there's one answer, it's a cult. <laughs> you know, we're, um, unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, this has been a great conversation. I wanna thank all of our panelists this evening and everyone who participated in the Q&A. And I wanna remind everyone to sign up for part three of the series. That one is a movement's voice in the rebellion and it's decolonizing the law. We are still finalizing the date of that one, but we will be sending out emails and posting it on Facebook and other social media, so stay tuned. And in that segment, we're going to take a closer look at how the law must change, how all of us need to shift our thinking to decolonize our own minds as well as the law. Maybe we started it on this one. Um, we will be having a roundtable format discussion with leaders in the rights of nature movement from across the country. So thank you to all the panelists this evening. You all did great. And um, thanks to everyone who joined the webinar. Good night.